Welcome to our continuing discussion of types of structural action. We have been talking extensively about axial tension and now we've turned our attention to axial compression. And you may recall that we said the compression elements can fail in one of two ways, either by material yielding, which in the case of steel would be a plastic flow, or in the case of concrete, a shattering of the material, or they can fail by elastic instability, wherein the structure begins to change shape in an uncontrollable way before the yield stress of the material has been reached. So elastic instability, or what we sometimes call for short buckling, uh, tends to occur when the materials are not braced sufficiently to keep them or force them to stay under the load. So buckling can be severely limited if the compression member is too slender or it's not properly braced. So we'd like to turn our attention to methods of bracing and the first one we want to talk about is triangulated bracing or sometimes called truss bracing or trust columns. So again, just to reiterate, um, we basically um, have talked about tension, tending to tear an element like this apart. We've also talked about putting compressive forces on elements, axial elements. So originally this element was straight and we applied these axial forces and then it began to buckle and take on this shape. And the only reason the structure didn't collapse all the way down is because we had this block of material right here that stopped the process so we could freeze it. And one of the important illustrations that I pointed out is that even though this thing has radically changed shape, uh, basically when we remove this load from it, it returns to its original shape. So that tells us that we never reached the yield stress and even in spite of all this deformation. So we're not very effectively utilizing material in a column that's this long and, and this slender. So we would like to um, explore ways of bracing this material so it will be more effective in serving its function. So this is an example. Here we have two columns, one right here And another one that you can't see that's hidden behind this facade here, but it's right there. And these two things are braced together. So this column is coming up and this point on that column is braced back to that footing and that footing. So it's not possible for it to move either in that direction or that direction. This point now, of course, is inherently braced down to this footing and now it's also braced back to this point, which we've already established as a stable point. So now this point becomes stable. Likewise, this point up here is stabilized down to that point and back to this point. And then this point is braced down to this stable point and back to that. So in essence, with this triangulation, we have produced a column that instead of buckling on a pattern like that will now buckle on a pattern more like this where we have a sine curve there and then a sine curve there and on down. So we've reduced the effective length from this dimension to only this dimension. So we have pretty drastically enhanced the column behavior or the ability to resist axial forces by introducing this triangular bracing. So these elements we consider part of the triangulated bracing. And in the case of this building, they've done a really elegant job of coordinating these diagonals with the slope of the, of the uh, stairs. Stairs have to be defined within some reasonable limits for human comfort. So the stairs are really governing the geometry of this structure but there's a nice opportunity to coordinate the uh, triangulated sloping elements and the sloping stairs. This is another building. Um, we have a point here that's and here and here that are at the top of some short 
thick columns that are braced or embedded down into the structure before below. So this point, that point, and that one are fairly well braced. So we can look at a point like this and it's braced back to here and it's braced down to there. And likewise, this point is braced down to here and braced to there. And this building was designed by SOM in San Francisco. And one of the things you'll notice when you look at one of their structures, they tend to decide what they're going to show to you or what they're going to emphasize in terms of the structure. And in fact, in some of their buildings, like the John Hancock building in Chicago, which has pretty dramatic triangulation on it, those are not actually physical elements you're seeing. They are facade elements that have been sculpted or formed to look like structure. But because of the weather in Chicago, the last thing you want are the heat trains associated with having a lot of steel structure both inside and outside because where the connections occur, there's uh, tremendous amounts of heat that get, get, gets conducted through those structural connections. Steel has a very high conductivity. Of all of our common structural materials, it has the highest thermal conductivity, except of course aluminum, which we don't usually use as part of our primary structure. We tend to use it as part of uh, window framing and things of that sort. Um, so these two points are stable. And by the way, this point can now be stabilized back to there because we have a floor beam that goes all the across here. And likewise, this point is stable back, stabilized back to that one. So these two columns, at, at the very least, are braced at mid-height at these two locations. And likewise, this point, whoops, is braced down to there, but also back to there, which is a stable point. And this is braced back to there. And of course, we have these two elements. And all this is helping to stabilize this line here. And now we've got these points bracing back to there and so forth. So literally, no matter what point we are in the structure, we can trace a whole slew of paths that take us back to some sort of stable footing. And so all these vertical columns are braced such that if we asked ourselves, they're braced at mid-height. So when we look at this, the buckling pattern will look something like this, where the effective length is from there to there which is a lot different from saying, well, these are long columns that are cantilevering out of the ground. Um, so we have lots of bracing that has been achieved through this triangulation process. This is the Alcoa building, by the way, in San Francisco. It's actually getting, getting quite old. It may have been built back in the 50s or early 60s. Um, so it's, it's well over a half a century old, but it's still a fairly striking and very modern kind of building. Okay, so we can use this kind of triangulation also in much lighter weight structures and in a much smaller scale. So for example, here you see uh, fully triangulated trusses that uh, are the compression members in this case. This is a really weird structure when you look at it because these are very tall columns and a given column is only supporting that much roof. So it's very little roof area and the loads on the roof tend to be quite light. So these are really tall columns, super light loads. They are the classic situation where you want to use a triangulated truss to give breadth to the column and still have it be stable. You'll notice another oddity here. Uh, there's a, a column at the top which goes down to the top of the truss and then the next bay down. So it's connected at this level and that level so we have a good moment connection so that this section of column doesn't tend to topple over up at the top. And likewise, uh, we have this really odd little, uh, these um, solid rods that come up out of the, out of the foundation structure. And by the way, this is really not a foundation structure as we understand it. There are some pretty sturdy beams down underneath here that are holding this up, but it's all basement down below. So um, these are super lightweight columns that are trussed in order to make them work. And by the way, you also notice these elements, this one, which is carrying the compression from the top, and these elements, which are the support from the bottom, they're offset a bit relative to 
this truss, which we normally try not to do. We call that an eccentric load. When we put an eccentric load into the column, we challenge the column much more structurally. We'd like to go down the center line of the column, but the loads in this case are so minute that no one cares because it's going to be a super lightweight structure anyway. What's really bizarre though is all this truss work eventually got sheathed in thin stone. So it looks like huge stone columns. But remember, this is all void down below here. So what we're looking at is, is um, a visual element which has been made to look very massive and very strong and very heavy. But in fact, it's actually quite delicate and lightweight. Sometimes we leave the truss work exposed and when we can produce extraordinarily beautiful structures. This is the George Washington Bridge in New York that links New York to New Jersey and it's one of my favorite and one of the most beautiful structures I think I've ever seen. But basically we've got a bunch of uh, compression elements here. Let me find my marker. So they're coming down and they are triangulated back uh, along various patterns so that the effective overall length of these compression elements is not very great. Um, this is maybe not such a pretty structure, but it illustrates one of the things I really love. I love these triangulated trusses that are clearly pin joints at the bottom, pin joints at the top, uh, and, and they're articulated in a way where they're much thicker near the middle. So, and that's where you need uh, breadth in order to resist buckling. Um, trusses like that can be used in much more beautiful situations. In this case, there are some compression struts across here, and then the triangulation is achieved through um, cross bracing the rods in the structure. Here's another one. This is a, a bizarre structure in that it has very limber joints here. These are really, really pin joints. And I don't know whether you can see it here, but this column actually has a hinge right in the middle of it. And there's a strut coming out and some tension members on it. And it can literally uh, fold in half. So these two elements were lying essentially on the ground when this element decided to unfold and lift the entire structure up. If you're going to do that, you need a super good pin joint. Here we have a pin going across here and another pin of rotation there. And those two pin joints give enough flexibility to this joint that the structure can actually erect itself. So um, we'd like to try to understand truss column behavior starting at the component level. Uh, so we might take a piece of PVC rod. So this is an image you've seen several times. It was, my God, it was straight originally. It has now started to buckle. And I don't even have a weight on it right now. There's just a finger pushing down to show the general shape that would occur, but I'm not pushing down any further than would be necessary to create this half of a sine curve, which is the classic buckling shape. We would like to brace that by triangulating it. So we did a, a bunch of truss columns uh, that the students did. Um, and the cross section in this case was square. And we said E is the uh, identifier of the cross-sectional dimension. And of course, the length of the column is here. And just for geometric consistency, we then did a triangulated pattern where we said the spacing between these joints is E also. And we varied E. We also varied one other thing. You'll notice here uh, in this truss, this joint that stabilizes these two elements stabilize that joint against movement in that direction. That joint is only stabilized one way and the lateral stabilization in this other direction occurs here and here. Turns out these two columns perform the same, but what we want to do is um, demonstrate a key point here, which is if we do a fairly slender column, we observe general overall buckling that's starting to assume this sign shape. In this case, it's not a very good sign curve because some of the joints in this weren't made too well, but that's the gist of it. So it has begun what we call overall buckling. And at some point when it deforms far enough off, the stresses near the center become excessive 
and we have buckling or crushing of the small members in compression near the center. But this is what initiated it, was the beginning to do overall buckling and or elastic instability and then it crimped at the center. Now if we do something that's much larger, we observe a different behavior. Long before we see any kind of overall buckling, we begin to see this snaky curve of the individual members and this would be an example of what we've talked about which is local buckling. So we've, we've reached the point where the overall column is fat enough that it's not exhibiting any kind of buckling failure. The buckling failure is occurring in the individual parts. We call this local buckling. And this is just a diagram that says that if we have uh, on the horizontal here we have the, the width of the column, so it's one inch or two inches or three inches. And what we observe is we saw this point and this one and this one and that one. Those were actually experimental points we observed. And then we drew the curves that we knew were the theoretical curves. So a column of zero breadth will have zero strength because it will buckle with under no force. And as the column uh, gets greater and greater breadth, it becomes more resistive to buckling. But then we cross over a transition where local buckling becomes the issue. And then as we make the spacing of the uh, brace points further and further apart, the column actually gets weaker. So the optimum column dimension for this particular geometry and this particular length would have been 1.6 inches. And that looks like this. So that's what we're showing here. If we change the geometry, the optimal, uh, the bracing pattern rather, the optimal uh, proportions change to what we see over here. Um, so the bracing pattern, of course, has some effect on what the optimal proportions will be. We actually see trust columns. We can see them even at the bottom of very tall buildings. And this is very rare though, because I mentioned earlier that the loads are so great and the, the brace points on the columns tend to be close enough together that we would just use super massive thick columns down at the base. But this is not necessarily true if the height of these columns is so great. We might actually even decide them, trust them, even at the bottom of the uh, Citigroup uh, center in New York, which is a 64-story building. Um, these outrigger columns are so tall that they're actually trussed. Um, and by the way, the uh, corners were left off. No columns were put on the corners, partly because they wanted to accommodate a church over here that already owned some property. And actually, they built them another church and, and bought the air rights to build this building. And while they were leaving off the structure on this corner, they said, wouldn't it be nice to leave it off on this corner also, uh, because that's where interesting things are happening at the intersection of the street. So this is what that building looks like. And you'll notice over here, there's some eating areas. There's a nice sweep around the corner here, as opposed to what would happen if the corner of the building came right down here. Uh, that would basically create a very unfriendly corner there. And so, Cutting this building back in this way has uh, done wonders for this corner in terms of making it more pedestrian friendly, but also bringing in more light. But this is the, the geometry, or the structural geometry rather. So there's elements that are bringing loads together and accumulating them here. And then they are passing down through these outrigger columns. And this truss pattern, this is called a K-truss for obvious reasons because the bracing looks like a K. In this case, the K is on its side. Um, but that's the pattern that was used at the base of this building, and this is what it looks like. So you see the K truss pattern right there. Sometimes we have such light loads that we're going to truss our truss elements. So here we have an overall truss geometry, and then this compressive strut has been further braced with all this truss work in here. Sometimes we'll use solid webs because we can buy a, a wide flange beam that's uh, up to uh, 44 inches from there to there. And so uh, in this case, uh, 
We've put two of those together and then welded some bracing elements. So we're using uh, triangulated uh, material and solid webs to stabilize these members. And there's an example of this kind of system nearby in Chapel Hill. The Dean Dome has these struts. So this is a tie member around the boundary here. These are compression struts that come up from these stabilized corners. There's a compression ring or square around the top. And these compression elements are actually made out of wide flange beams turned on the side, top and bottom, and welded together into trusses. So if you go inside, you see those wide flanges on the bottom here and on the top, and then triangulation weaving them together, which creates an interesting kind of tube that you can walk up inside of. And it's a fairly disconcerting experience because the surface you're walking on, even though it's a solid surface, has a very steep slope. And you always have this feeling that if you lost your footing, you'd kind of bounce down and probably bounce off the thing and whack yourself on some of the webbing. But it provides really excellent access. And for any of you who are ever thinking of designing an arena like this, keep in mind sooner or later you have to have catwalks and access to things up there and you might as well make them part of the overall structure. So these show some catwalks up above in the compression ring that goes around the boundary up above and to give you a sense of scale. Here's a person standing inside there. That ends our discussion of axial compression where we're looking at triangulated bracing as a way of reducing the overall length relative to buckling.